Hi everyone. So I think there was a question about degrading. Actually, realized that I never mentioned about grading in last lecture or previously. So I'll be going over that in the announcements as well. So um, just a second. Okay, let's get started with the lecture nine. So I hope everyone's okay with the assignment one. I think it should be easy for everyone, right? That's what I'm hoping. So, so I'll start with some announcements and then do some recap, actually a lot of recap because today we'll be actually going over a transformer we did that in last lecture too, but we'll be doing that again with the code, not just the um, these mathematical equations. So assignment, so probably everyone's now aware that the assignment one is due today. So I never mentioned about late assignment policy. So I'll be deducting 10% for every late day, every 24 hours to be more exact. So if you submit like a one minute after 1 11 p.m., then I'm sorry, but your assignment score will be 10% deducted. So make sure that you uh, you submit in time. And assignment two will be hopefully released today. I'll, I'm aiming for, but um, yeah. So, but if 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 if, it, if I don't finish it by today, then probably tomorrow. So I'll try to get it done pretty soon. And final projects. So I actually forgot to mention this, but I'll put this on the website too. A few students asked me about su substituting their project with the, uh, basically substituting the final project with their, their ongoing project. And that's perfectly fine. I actually encourage you to do so if there is, you have one. But the, the, there is a important requirement, just a second, that the assignment you're working on must be Basically, you're planning to submit that to an appropriate venue. So what, I, what, I'm, what I'm saying, appropriate venue, has to be a conference, workshop, or very, basically something that gets um, refereed. You get some reviews and you have some acceptance rate. That's number one. And number two is that you should be the first author or co-first author. So basically, I don't want you to use your project that you're helping someone else as your final project. That's not the point of the final project. I want you to basically work on some NLP, real problem, real NLP problem as a basically the uh, leading or the first author, right? So uh, that's a really important requirement. So when you're ask, asking me through email, please make sure to actually check these conditions and tell me that these conditions are met. And I'll look at the project topic and let you know if the topic looks good too. So basically the number four, you have to meet three conditions, right? Number one is the project topic has to meet NLP, has to be a something about NLP. And number two are number two and three are these two. And about whether it, it fits NLP is basically something that I decide and give you approval. So let me know. And I think the other two probably you can determine yourself. So please make sure. And another thing was, um, what was it? I think that was it. Oh yeah, regarding the grading plus yeah. So I updated the website last week, although I forgot to mention that in one Monday's lecture. So about the grading. So I, I thought that it would be a good time to really be precise about the grading. I intend to make the grading um, basically absolute, which means that you will not be compared with other students to get your grade. It's about absolute number that what you obtain, you get from the assignments and final project. And, but then except for one grade, which is A plus. So I only intend to give A plus to only really few students. I think it should be reserved for that. It's not just about doing well. Um, but then up to A, which corresponds to 4.0, you'll be getting as long as your uh, your assignment scores are good 
whether I mean, of course, then it's possible that everyone gets A. But even then, even then, I might have to double check. I'm pretty sure I have the authority to decide this. So, but I'll double check. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure if the school requires me to, for instance, you have to give like at least 30% of the students B or, you know, C. In that case, then, yeah, I'll be sad, but still, I'll, I'll have to do that. So um, I'll double check with this. Okay, so if you have, do you have any question? Oh yeah, so yeah, just one thing. So yeah, so basically, if you haven't looked the website yet, then I'll just tell you what the grading scheme is. Um, I mean, the, the how the grade, grade will be determined. So if you get 90% or above, then you will be getting at least A. You might get A plus depending on if you're top students in the class, which is translating into 4.0 GPA. If you are in 80 to 89%, then you'll be getting B or B plus or A minus, wait, was it? Right. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So basically something like, so I'll have to draw the exact line, but something like 85 will be something like B plus, right? And like 88, 89 will be uh, A minus. So A minus will be 3.7, B plus will be 3.3, B is 3.0. 70 to 79 will be C, and this is ranging from 2.0 to 2.9. And Below 70, which is 69 or less, will be strictly um, basically fail. So hope, I hope that you get above 70 or at least 70 to pass the class. And I'm giving a lot of bonus points, right? So uh, hopefully those bonus points make you less stress, stressed about getting, you know, like the small points that you might miss. Okay, so. Overview about transformer and ask me any question if you have any. All right. So I think we went through this and probably as of now, you're familiar with what transformer is. It entirely removes RNNs via positional encoding, enables GPU parallelization. It uses self-attention only proposed Multi-attention, which I told you that is very important for this to work. And there is unidirectional attention for decoding and all these characteristics basically allow us to scale the model up and also simplify the architecture design process so that we can be less concerned about really the details of the model, but more about, I would say, other things, right? For instance, data or how you formulate your problem, etc. So, yeah, that's right. So um, please submit something. So as long as you submit something, I, I can guarantee that you will not get zero. Yeah. So, I mean, and please do something about the problem at least. I, I can guarantee that you will not get zero point. Although um, the exact rating will be, uh, so there will be actually, that there will be a rubric soon, but that will not be um, really revealed or you will not be able to see them, but we will have some rubric that for instance, you have some code that looks like you have you understood something that will, get, will give you some partial points. And if it's working pretty well, then we'll give you some additional points. And if it's accuracy is also good enough, then you'll get probably full points, something like that. So at least do something. Yeah, this was about question on the chat, by the way. Okay, so, and so in the last lecture, we basically decomposed, we dissected the transformer into several parts and we tried to go over each of them and explain mathematically how they make sense. So doing, we'll be doing a bit of recap today and the most of the today's lecture will be devoted towards actually how they translate into code. So we talk about self-attention with query key value. 
So we, I told you that transformer is similar to Long et al. 2015 with a scaling factor. And it's basically, you, are, you have a, some, you basically you have a, some hidden state coming up from the previous layer and you have some transformation, linear transformation that creates QKV and you do some matrix multiplication among these, these matrices to obtain the attention value, which is corresponding to softmax. And you multiply that to V so that you can actually obtain the attended values. And I told you that the, the square root of D is for preventing the inner prop being too big when the dimension is too big. So if the D is big, then you will, let's say D is like something like 100, like um, I'll say 100, then D square will be 10. So you're dividing your inner product by 10. It's basically scaling the numbers to reasonable values, not too big. And we talk about multi-hot attention, which is quite useful and actually quite essential for transformer because if you just use single attention, which means you just attend on one thing, then when you're trying to process one token, you can only focus on one part of the sequence due to the nature of softmax, which basically tries to give really spiky attention instead of a smooth attention. Um, but then of course, we might want to focus on several different things at one time step, right? So that's why we need several attention heads, which is called multi-attention. And this enables us to model really a uh, more complex relationship with relatively few layers. So I think um, now you're familiar with this equation too. So we compute the attention in the, in the usual way with each head and we do that for um, H number of heads. In the diagram, there are three heads, right? There are one, two, three. So we do the at head attention and then we have a different attention on these each head and we con concatenate those heads and then do some linear transformation to obtain the output of this entire attention layer in each layer, basically. This is like sub layer though. It's because we're talking about this layer, right? This orange thing is a sub attention layer. And the one layer is corresponding to some normalization and um, skip connection, and then another fit for network with another skip connection and normalization with layer norm. So that's corresponding to this fit for network, this blue part, which is just uh, really simple. I think you're very familiar with this. You have input X and you do some linear transformation with bias and then do value and then do another linear transformation and then add bias. And we talked about positional encoding, which allows us to differentiate different words at different positions, I'm saying word in different positions. And if we don't have this, then there is no way we can differentiate between a sentence that it has been completely shuffled, which doesn't make sense, right? Because I don't think uh, anyone can really understand what it means to, um, what it means when the words are completely shuffled, if the sentence is really long, especially. So, and, Okay. All right, so I'll get back to your question right after uh, our recap, yeah. So transformer use position encoder that gets added to the word embedding. So word embeddings are getting becoming different. Original interest in um, Super at all, 2015 with a little tweak. So um, there, these are basically sinusoidal graphs. And I told you that these were relatively effective, but then these days what people are using more is uh, positional embeddings that is fixed per position and works pretty well too. And it's much easier in many ways. So um, that's something to really point out. For instance, bird to use transformer, but position encoder gets replaced with um, some position embedding instead of this sinusoidal graph. Okay, so this is uh, where we got up to last lecture. So before we start with the new lecture, I mean, today's lecture, uh, some question from, okay. So question is, mm, I think the performance of RNN is varying too much depending on the initialization. Should you fix the random seed? I have little confusion in the last question of adapting BERT embedding. Is it referring adaptation of contextual encoded embedding of tokens or just word embedding matrix of BERT? 
Yeah, good question. So number one, actually, this is a really, really important point. So this is really entirely the point actually was of the assignment. So, so um, I think I mentioned you that in uh, lecture, RNNs are worse than LSTM, but I didn't mean that the that worseness is not necessarily necessarily about uh, the it's not able to reach the really same capacity. It's more of a LSTM is much stable during training, whereas the RNN is not, as you said. So basically, that was like really whole point. And it is actually possible, I think, especially in the recent works, I think people can find good seed or if they do a lot of tuning, then they can find an RNN that works pretty well. And I think it's possible that uh, your RNN score can be very, very, very close to LSTM in some cases, in which means basically um, um, you found a good seed, right? Um, that's fine. I mean, um, but hopefully, uh, yeah, uh, as you you have tried several seeds, you have seen that it's relatively unstable. So hopefully you mentioned that in the um, in the um, in the assignment. And I recommend you to fix the seed. Yeah, um, definitely, because otherwise uh, reproducing will be difficult. So actually, that's a really good point. Uh, please uh, fix your random seed if you have not. But it, it's not really. Um, I will not say it's necessary for the assignment though. So it's fine if you haven't, but um, if, you ha if you have time to work on it still, then I recommend doing some random seed. And number two is that uh, what I intended was just using the bird word embeddings, not the contextualized word embedding, a word um, embeddings. I mean, um, probably contextualized, I would say word encoding. Um, so definitely, of course, you will get better number if you use the entire BERT word embedding. But um, the point here was more of a, if you use better word embeddings, such as glove or those word embeddings coming from BERT, then you will get better accuracy. Yep, so, and probably that's easier for you too, because if you try to fine tune the entire BERT, then it will be um, more computationally expensive. Even if you do not, then still, you'll have to compute a lot of BERT. So, what I meant is word embedding, just word embedding, not the contextualized ones. Did I answer your question? So I hope I did. If you have a question, yeah, please let me know. And yeah, I mean, feel free to speak out too if you whether prefer that. Yeah, you don't have to always ask through the chat. Although, of course, if you're preferring chat, that's fine too. Okay, so, and there are a few things that we I, I didn't have time to mention about decoder, especially. I'll be giving a bit more details about decoder. Um, so how does a decoder works? Decoder works in a really similar way, but there is a one key difference. Actually, I'll say two key, key differences. One is that decoder, when they're computing multi-head attention, they not only has to look at the, 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 being the words that are being decoded, but also the outputs from the encoder, right? Because that's the whole point. You have to be dependent on the input encoding. So that's why you have this, um, arrow, right? This arrow is basically going into multi-head attention. But before you do this multi-head attention, you have a one more layer of uh, multi-head attention that's just within the decoder. And you might think why this is the case. There are pros and cons. One, the pro is here that basically if you do this way, then because usually decoder, uh, because if you do uh, your attention first and then do another layer of attention, then good thing is, of course, your attention computation depends on the, 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 I would say time complexity is, I mean, paralyzable, but still, if your model is sequentially computed, then your time complexity will be T squared, right? And then if you consider both decoder and encoder, then you will have a longer sequence to compute attention on. So it could be more beneficial at least like efficiency wise to compute the decoder side first and then um, compute the, actually what I tried to say was, um, that's not the case, sorry about that. Um, 
So what I was trying to say is that the um, probably I think I said it wrong. Yeah. So forget about that. Never mind. But basically, they compute the attention twice, right? They, they compute the attention on itself, and then they compute the attention with the encoder again. And the really the point, another uh, actually the really the advantage here is that you can actually somehow sort your uh, decoder before you compute the attention with other things because if you just use this and your input, then maybe, of course, maybe um, the um, your decoder will not have a. It's not, I would say, contextualized enough before you are computing attention with the encoder. So these are these are more of a hypothetical um, benefits that why you have to basically separate these two processes, right? Um, so I cannot be really certain about these. These are more of a design choice, but at least like at the model itself right now, you will see that um, there are two two levels of attention and there that's a, a bit different from the encoder side. So encoder side, you have only one attention, but in the decoder side, you compute the attention in itself first, and then you compute the attention with the encoder after that. And there are some recent work that actually just tries to do one, one layer of attention instead of two sub layers of attention to, for instance, uh, better efficiency. And other difference is that the attention in decoder cannot look forward, which means because when you're training decoder, because you're a teacher forcing, you have your first token in, on the input side of the decoding transformer will be start token. And then you have a, your intended output shifted by one word as the input, and you have the your intended outputs in position. So basically it's the training wise, it's quite similar to how you would train on the encoder side, right? But then the problem is that we want it to be recurrent, which means we want it to be autoregressive, that it cannot look forward. It's always, re, re, it's re, recurrent, right? Because you, have, you can only create one word at a time. You cannot look forward. So that's why we want to prevent any, in any time step to look forward. And in order to do that, when you're computing attention, you intentionally mask out uh, the values that are coming from the, the, from the uh, time step that's more than current time step. So we'll be, it will be more clear if we look this in the, um, in the code. It's a bit more complicated to describe it in with uh, some, um, just with the you know, natural language or mathematical expressions. Code is sometimes easier to understand. But other things are quite similar, right? You have a lot of um, uh, layers here, are six layers, n equals six in tra original transformer, and you have some fit forward. And at the end, you basically have linear and softmax to get the output probability. And this is training time, but during inference time, you, you, you create one word at a time. So you're applying, you have a one, you apply encoder just once, but you have to apply decoder several times, right? You apply decoder at first to get one word. And then you're, when you're applying the decoder at the second time, then you're applying decoder with the first word as the also input to decoder. So hopefully, uh, let me know if you have any um, question or confusion, but otherwise we'll, we'll now go to the other details. And some details that might be a bit different from what we have seen until now is that we're the machine translation is very has large data set compared to other data sets, including sentiment classification and question answering. So this is it was actually trained on 4.5 million sentences pairs of uh, English and German. They were also actually trained on English French, but English German was more of a um, the the key, I would say, result because it's more difficult than English French. And they tokenize with byte pair encoding. So we learned about how we can tokenize with simple white space encoding, right? And um, that's really simple and in many cases quite effective, but actually um, it's not the state of the art tokenizer, apparently. Um, so people used to use a regular expression-based tokenizer, uh, but now these days the norm is that we use byte pair encoding, which is data-driven subword tokenization. So we'll look into this in probably ne next lecture, which is describing a few other details, things like this. And there was a dropout of a P equals 0.1 at the output of each sublayer. And there was also dropout with P, P equals 0.1 
at the summation of word embedding and put, uh, the position in encoding. Basically, when you're summing the sinusoidal graph with the word embedding, they have a one dropout of a 0.1, of course, during training time. And there was a residual connection. I told this is just basically adding. It's a fancy word for adding. Layer norm is something that we might, uh, we will actually discuss in the hopefully next lecture. You can think of it as regularization technique. That's something at least uh, uh, it's regularization basically prevents you to overfit, right? But also layer norm actually also helps you to converge faster too. So it's very good training mechanism that um, basically was popular in RNNs and LSTMs and turns out that it's very essential for transformer. So at least uh, at the time. So maybe people have found more ways these days, but at the time layer norm was like really crucial component in the transformer for making this work and converge fast enough. And there was also label smoothing. Basically label smoothing is that um, when you're predicting word, you're trying to give a loss that's, you're computing cross entropy. Probably you have done your assignment then you know what cross entropy is. And um, cross entropy is quite similar to log probability of your output. But basically it turns out that uh, if you're formulating your problem as a cross entropy, then you can do a bit more complicated things. Like um, you can give a label that's not one hot. Basically your answer is not just one hot, your uh, output word. It's your, 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 your uh, target is each word, right? And But then you can smooth the label to make it more um, probabilistic. Then in that case, you're comparing between two probabilistic distributions, right? Um, so in that case, then we cannot use just local probability. We have to use cross entropy. And that's where the, the definition of cross entropy comes handy, I will say. But we will, this is more about details that we might, we will actually get later. So don't worry about that for now. Um, so results, yeah. So back then in 2017, so as you see, um, all these work, sorry, all these work were LSTM or some RNN based or some convolution neural net based. So um, they are very, I would say, I mean, convolution is kind of parallelizable, but other things are really uh, sequential, right? And you'll see that first of all, transformer is able to outperform that. So it's not just uh, similar, but they are outperforming some of the good models too, especially English, German. And for instance, the best model was 26.36 blue score and they're improving by more than two points. And this is really big actually in, in machine translation, improving by two points. But really the uh, another amazing part is that the training cost is much smaller in the order, in the order of like, uh, like 10 to 100, right? So for instance, compare this to this, right? It's how many times, 20 times, right? And this training cost is like uh, almost 1000 times or 300 times less. And that's just base model, of course. But if you compare even big model, it's quite comparable. I mean, the accuracy is better, I'm saying. And then the training cost is at least three times better with the, um, English to German and English to French still it's more than I would say uh, 50 times right so as you see this was a much not only just a better accuracy but also training cost was lower especially because of this um, um, and then actually one thing I wanted to point out is that it's actually also because it took less time to train it's not just about the model being lighter Probably, I don't remember really well, but probably maybe model is not lighter. Actually, it might be heavier, but then it was converging faster. This base model was converging in 12 hours, for instance, quite fast. And that's because of uh, um, different things, including, of course, parallelization too. But, and that was really, I think, very shocking at, at the time because it's um, people thought that it's uh, RNNs are not parallelizable, but in some sense, they are there are a lot of parallelizable components in sequential models. So, and then since then, basically everything now started to, you know, people now start just use transformer to model everything, especially after birth actually. 
Bird only came out after I would say one year after this, almost. So it's very it was very um, short period of time that a lot of advancements have been made. Okay. So we'll be now going to annotate transformer. I talked about this, right? Um, so it's a Jupyter notebook based implementation of transformer with detailed explanations uh, by um, Alex Rush. He's a professor at now Cornell. He was at uh, Harvard, I think, when he was writing this. And we're gonna walk through this notebook today together. That was, it's like really important part. Um, so um, actually it's a bit early for the um, short break, but I'll anyways have to, yeah, get a break really quick. So uh, we'll go for a really quick break of three minutes and we'll go into the notebook when we come back. Yep, see you soon.
All right. So everyone's back. Let's get to the um, annotate transformer. All right. So I uploaded this link on the website too. And so we're going to be um, slowly walking through it so that um, we can understand all of these, um, you know, and hopefully you can read again to better understand it. So just to give you a background, so this is almost exact copy of the paper, actually the content of the paper with code and some comments in the in in each i would say subsections right so it's basically just it's a paper actually with some additional code so it's uh that's why it's annotated transformer so and also note that the the, the torch version they're using is pretty old 0 0.3.0 so right now we're already like 1.8 or 1.9 so um there will be very different some different syntax that you might not be so familiar with. So I think probably should be okay though. I mean, for instance, like there are things that people don't use much, like um, people don't use the uh, a variable directly much these days. They have all the layers we need to make these things. But as you see, you're importing out quite standard things, right? You're importing NumPy, Torch, and then it's basically containing a lot of uh, neural net network layers. Some functionals, these are probably used for softmax, like these some functions that don't have any parameters to train or sigmoid, things like that. Math and copy time, they're coming from Python. Autograd variable is um, the, so you can basically define this to directly define your parameters to train. And PLTs for plotting, Seaborn is just making the, um, the plot very pretty. So you don't really need it if you just are, um, you know, worried about the um, actual the code implementation, but it's quite quite useful actually in many cases. And uh, you put this to display your plot on the notebook directly. So first of all, um, background, we talk about this, right? So uh, the goal of reducing sequential computation is um, quite important. And they're especially important because we want to use GPUs and GPUs are all about parallelization. So we don't want to be sequential. We want to be very pretty fast. And they're saying that the self-attention has been used a lot, but then it has been always used with in conjunction with other things like convolution neural net or RNNs. But what they're saying is that, okay, we're the first to really do this. Transduction is basically uh, mapping. So you're map, you have a, you, you can think of transformers as some six sequence to sequence mapping, and that mapping process is called transduction. It's basically synonym for mapping. And they're saying transformer is like first a uh, mapping model relying relying entirely on self attention to compute the representation of the input and output without using sequence aligned RNNs or convolution. So that was the like whole point of the paper. Okay, so. So here is they are saying that um, the you can think of a sequence sequence, sequence model as uh, something that you map um, an input sequence of x one to x n to an um, output sequence z, which is z one to z n. So basically, oh actually sorry, so my bad. This is like representation. So output is y, output is y, and they are saying that x one to x n is mapped to a sequence of a continuous representation, which is corresponding to each input word x one to x n, and then you're mapping to this to a length m sequence. Um, and in general, we we want to decode one at a time. That was the the basically how we what we saw in the original sig to sig, right? They're basically following the same paradigm of uh, generating one one token at a time with some recurrence model. So actually, one thing I wanted to point out is that I think this was like a really important question that sometimes people ask. So by the way, the self-attention is non-recurrent only on the encoder side, by the way. 
So on the decoder side, it's very recurrent. Actually, it's it's basically recurrent neural net. I mean, that's like definition of recurrent neural net, right? You're basically applying one at a time, right? Um, it's just that on the encoder side, you can think of it as non-recurrent. It's very parallelizable. So at each time step, the model is autoregressive, which means basically you're decoding one word at a time. You're depend, uh, you're not forward looking, and it's not parallelizable. So you're consuming the previous gen generated symbols as additional input when generate when generating the text, right? So probably these are all clear. So that's where they define the encoder decoder model. And um, it's, I think, not just transformer, but this is applicable to every kind of a sig to sig or encoder decoder model where you define a PyTorch class uh, with the encoder and decoder and source embedding, target embedding, and generator. Right? Source, uh, so in that case, uh, it's quite um, simple functions, right? Uh, you have a, so you, I wanna actually talk, talk about encoding first. Encoding is pretty, it's pretty simple. I mean, you have a source and you have some source mask so that you, if, even if you have some padding, you wanna ignore them. And you just basically uh, pass that. Just a second, I'll pass that to the encoder, which basically, gets the source as the, uh, these are the basically words, right? These are words or word IDs, input IDs. And then you embed those input IDs into some embeddings. And then you get that as an input with the source mask, which is basically one, one or zero. If you we want to consider the current word as the input, then it's one. If it's zero, then we want to ignore the, that, that, that time steps input. And you output some encoding that's corresponding to Z, Z1 to Zn. And that encoded values are basically what you can consider as the uh, memory in the decoding side, because you encode it, you're considering it as a memory of a, a source memory. And you put that, this, this is the what you have encoded from the input side. And you do the same thing on the target words, just like your source. And then you have some source mask and target mask. Of course, you need source mask because you don't want to consider everything in your memory but also you need the target mask so that you also ignore some things in the target. And so I think these two are these two functions are clear. And basically the forward function is using these two functions. So whenever they have source in, uh, input IDs and target output IDs and mask and target mask, they just apply it in a sense, of course, very straightforward, right? You encode it and then put that, uh, use that as a memory and, and then Basically, um, you you get you you give the uh, the mask and you get the target and target mask, right? So hopefully, pretty straightforward. And you have a generator here, and um, it's uh, just just a really simple part is that um, you basically just have a um, you, I think, where is it? Oh, just for a second. Yeah, so, so basically what this does is that you have a model and this model, we want to uh, translate the model into word generating function. And the, how you do that is basically just, you have a model's output dimension and you have a vocab dimension and model's output dimension will be mapped to vocab dimension to obtain the probability distribution of the vocab using this softmax. But you might wonder why, okay, so self-projection is basically mapping the output embedding, the final decoder side to vocab size. And, but then why do you use log, log softmax? So I think this also probably is quite familiar with the, what you were asked on the assignment, right? So computing softmax, especially for training, actually is very unstable because at the end you have to compute log on top of softmax. And in the assignment you were asked people, you were asked why do you do log softmax instead of uh, 
I mean, why do you have a dedicated function, so log softmax, instead of, a, for instance, why don't you just compute log after computing softmax? It's because numerical instability. And hopefully, you'll find why that's the case in the assignment. But um, I'll at least um, reiterate what has been stated in the assignment, which is that um, if you want to compute log after softmax, it's better to use this function than uh, do it yourself. So um, if you're, don't try to use log and then softmax. You use log under bar softmax if, if possible. Okay, so hopefully that's clear and everyone now knows this really familiar diagram. Um, yeah. So this is just a utility function that basically allows you to um, clone identical layers, which I'm pretty sure it's, there is a better way to do this now, I think in PyTorch, um, but back then, yeah, you have to, you have to do it really weird way. Um, you just want to basically create a six layers of identical architecture. So you create an encoder which is consisted of a, a same architecture layer with uh, six times of different parameters. That what, that's what it's doing here, layer and N. So they you did it at six times. And there's a um, layer norm, which I told you it's, basically you can think of it as the input and output to the layer norm is same size, but then you do some normalization across the dimensions, across the uh, channels basically to make it less, to make training much faster and also stable. But you can kind of ignore that this is just something that's kind of identical function for now that just helps you. I mean, at least the dimensional wise, it's exactly identical. The input to the layer norm is exactly same size as output to the layer norm. And of course, if you are doing four pass, then it's quite simple. You just apply um, the input several times with different layer on itself recurrently, right? It's layer after layer. And there is some normalization at the end. And um, so each layer norm is um, basically this function and um, there's a normal normalization going on, right? So, um, so um, I will just actually give you really quick detail. So what it does is that given the input, you compute the mean, you compute the standard deviation, and you basically um, normalize with this mean and standard deviation. But there is one more thing, which is you basically scale it with uh, some vector, two vectors, bias and gain. And both are vectors. And you have uh, some epsilon, which is a really small value that uh, prevents uh, bad things happening, usually. Epsilon, epsilon, the term epsilon is used for that in uh, deep neural nets. You're preventing something bad happening, but it's not really doing anything really special in many cases. Mm, so it's layer norm class. Of course, now these days you can find this class from PyTorch. They are natively in the PyTorch library, but back then it was not. And there is a skip connection. And this key connection I told you is quite simple. Um, of course, they're, when they're saying sublayer connection, they're saying they do the skip connection with the la layer norms. They have this layer norm class and they also apply dropout at this, at this point of layer. But of course, it, dropout is not necessarily um, associated with the connection. They basically have a dropout connection and layer norm. They combine these three and put into one um, module that's called sublayer connection. And what they do in forward pass is quite simple. Basically just they, I told you add with add the input with the output of this module that has applied dropout sub layer and norm. And I think that's good. And uh, sub layer is basically the function that will be applied here. So what is sub layer then? Sub layer, we know that it's about using these um, what was it like either fit for networks and multi tension? So we haven't defined that what sub layer is, but um, if that's whatever that is, then we'll be putting that into this class. And each, so we know that each layer, so each layer being the, there are six layers, right? Then each layer has two sub layers. That's why 
we're using two sub layers here. Um, so we basically init initialize each inquiry layer with um, basically two sub layers. And here the important thing is that you're creating two sub layers, right? Um, two sub layers. And then you have a, at first sub layer is uh, self-attention, right? And, th and the second layer is fit forward. So that's why we have self-attention and fit forward. You remember that here, right? First layer, sub layer is multi self-attention and second sub layer is fit forward. So that's why you apply here, you apply X with the sub -layer, first sub layer and self attention, right? So you have a self attention layer applied to this first sub uh, and self attention applied, and you basically wrap that with sub first sub layer. And the output of the first sub layer is X, and you apply another sub layer with fit forward. So hopefully you get that. So you, we define the encoder layers. This encoder layer is corresponding to this entire thing. Oh, by the way, so just to give you an, um, how this is being approached, so probably you have noticed already. So this is like top-down approach. We're not going uh, bottom-up. Bottom-up will be defining the attention first, right? But we're doing more of top-down. So defining the overall structure first, and then we're going into the details. Uh, decoder side is also stack of N6 identical layers. And it's quite similar, right? Decoder is, we saw the encoder up there, right? Encoder and decoder are quite similar. In fact, it's actually the only difference is that you have memory here instead of just target uh, the, the input and the target. When input and the input mask, source and source mask. And you have a layer that's quite similar, but you have a memory as an additional input. So this layer has to be quite similar to the encoder layer but the only difference is that you have an additional input memory that's basically corresponding to this thing. Okay. Um, so let's look into decoder layer. Each deco see, decoder is con consists of six decoder layers and each decoder layer has a self attention component and source attention component and fit for component. So it's quite clear too now, right? Because I told you that we first do self attention in the first sub layer. And in the second sub layer, we do the source attention that has a connection to the memory. And the third sub layers, we have fit for. So exactly the same thing as the self attention, uh, source attention, and then fit forward. And we have, a, um, so we have defined these things in the uh, module. And then now we can do, um, we define memory to be M and then we first compute, of course, self-attention here. And then we compute source attention on top of that. And note that this self-attention is exactly the same as the encoder attention with a bit of difference, which is basically preventing the model to look forward. But source attention is a bit different. Um, they put M as the, what they're looking at. This is a, this that we'll be seeing what this attention layer is soon. So it's kind of top down. So it's kind of not clear what that means, but basically this X is what you're using as the query and this M and M are key and value, basically what you're using it for the key and value. Of course you have to you have some, um, actually in the attention layer, you have some linear transformation to make them work. So you are doing source attention and then after that, you're computing the fit forward. Same thing as the inquiry layer. And here's exactly the point of uh, preventing the model to look for because at each time step, you want the model at, for decoder, your attention should, not, should only look at the either current time step or the previous time steps, but not forward. So we create what's called more of a trigonal um, triangle matrix, I would say. That's exactly this. And how they create that is using TRIU. So basically, basically this, what this means is that you're creating triangle matrix with upper being ones. So 
um, basically you can be either TRIL or TRIU if you want to make the upper triangle or lower triangle to be one. And um, yeah, that's what you're doing here. Basically you're creating this, 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 this matrix and you basically apply that to attention mask. Okay, so far so good. So ask me any question if you have. All right, so now it's time to uh, define this attention layer, self-attention or source attention. So how do we compute attention? So we have this, uh, discussed this in the uh, lecture, right? We basically do this QKB thing where Q and K get met matrix multiplied and you scale it and mask and softmax and met mol at the end, which is equivalent to this, this equation exactly. So we just basically just exactly translate this into um, PyTorch code, which is we get query Q, key K, and value V. And then you just do, first of all, you obtain what the size is. And then you met mol query and key. You have to transpose K because you have there, there's a transpose in the K side. You transpose uh, the first, the, the second last and the last dimension. And then you divide it by the square root of DK, which is basically the last dimension of query. And then if the mask is not provided, then of course you just have a mask that doesn't have any effect. And you might wonder why is minus one E9? And that's because, that's exactly because we are computing softmax. And in the softmax, your value will not be ignored if it's zero because softmax is basically you exponentiate that value and then do um, your proportional, you compute the proportional, right? So then if every value is zero, then exponentiation of zero is one, right? So you want the exponentiation of your exponentiation of your value to be zero, then you have to have super low values for large negative value, which is negative one E nine. That's why you actually fill that with this some large number, which is like negative one billion to ignore something in softmax. And you compute the attention. And then of course, if there's dropout, you have only dropout during in training time in the inference time, you will not drop out. And then you do the metmol at the end, right? With the softmax value and V. So the V here and the P attention is what you compute from the softmax. And not only you, you return this entire value, which is basically the attended values, but you also return the weights, which is P attention. These are the more of a, um, the, the weights that indicate where you're looking at the attention weights. And they discuss here, right? The, the two most common used attention functions are additive attention, which I think you remember, which was basically the uh, very inefficient way of uh, uh, computing the attention, the original attention from the Badanao et al, 2015. But the paper says that, um, um, where is it? Dot product attention is much faster and more space efficient in practice. So we discussed this, hopefully you remember that. And now we have to actually, once we have defined this attention function, now we have to remember the multi-head attention and multi-head attention uses the attention with some, some um, value decomposition, um, separating and concatenations. So this is a bit complicated because uh, there is a, some optimization, optimization happening here. So um, we'll try to give a careful look, but try to also read this again, because it's a bit more confusing because um, we're trying to be efficient. We want to make things as parallelizable as possible. So let's take a look. We define some parameters here, right? Um, hopefully. These are all familiar with you. So, um, so here's the one important thing. So here the DK is the, what's the, the dimension of the, uh, the Q and K and V after they are separated into multi-head. That's why it's D model divided by H. H is number of heads, right? But then what we do is because once we obtain v, uh, the, the this value here and then we use this for the next layers um 
multi-head attention, right? And when they're when we are doing that, we basically divide that into um, we divide that into uh, by h. So suppose that the d model is something like uh, five twelve, and let's say we have a uh, let's say sixteen heads. Then five twelve divided by sixteen is how much is it? Thirty two, right? So what that means is then you basically um, have a uh, the the previous layers output to be five twelve dimensions, and then you divide that into sixteen heads where each head has thirty two dimensions. That's decay not D model. So DK is uh, that, H is number of heads. Linear is just linear that's mapping from D model to D model. This is just basically um, this part, this linear part. And attention is the attention layer that we will be defining. Um, and dropout is just regular dropout. And here's the, a bit of a complicated part coming. So yeah, um, so, yeah so we'll try to, um, have a, some explanation about this, why, what's happening. All right, so here is it. We have X, X will be, what's dimension will be X? X will be um, basically, you have a uh, say, N number of uh, words, and then each word has embedding of 512. But then you basically um, reshape this with so originally um, 512, but you divide that into 16 and 32. So this times this will be 512, which will be the actually the, the um, dimension of X, the last dimension. This was actually size of uh, M batches. This is sequence length, by the way, this dimension is sequence length and 512, but 512 got divided into two numbers, H and DK. And then you transpose one and two, which means you transpose H and DK so that you can operate with the heads. I mean, not operate with the heads, but heads is at the, at the, uh, at the at, uh, last dimension and DK is now here, right? And you do this um, basically for, and then basically you apply, uh, you do this after you apply your linear transformation of X, right? So let's say this is the first layer, then your word embedding comes up and you apply some linear transformation with L. And then um, you basically apply this um, reshaping for each of query key and value. So that's the important thing. You apply this for each of a query key value with different linears. So query and key value are all working separately here. They have different linear transformation for each of them and then um, reshaping followed by that, yeah. And then you then after doing this, then basically what you can have, you have is that, um, this is an important thing, right? M batches, sequence lengths, and this will, you because of transposition, this will be self dot D underscore K. So this portion alone is, equivalent to just one attention head. And you have uh, 16 of them, which is indicated by this number. So that's why you apply attention on this query key value. And basically um, what I wanted to say is that you apply attention on these things all with independent hats and if you remember what the attention was doing at the top this was all actually all very um i'll say where is it wait just one second my bad okay uh, so i'll never mind i'll say this again so one and two i have missed Mis, uh, counted. So one and two is this and this, right? So one is this and two is this. So what that what we're doing is then we're putting H here and the sequence length to the uh, last, second last dimension, which enables us to basically consider these two dimensions as just um, batch size similar to. 
we are interested in actually the sequence length after transposition and the dimension. And that's exactly how the actually attention function was defined because it's not actually being absolute relative to the, um, the um, start dimension, but actually you're using minus two and minus one here, right? So that means then you're using minus one, which is the DK dimension and minus two is sequence length. That's exactly why they did this way instead of, uh, for instance, uh, if the length was three, then this will be two and this is one, right? If you're counting from the, the start position, the first, but then you're counting from the end position so that you can actually apply this handy um, multi attention in a really easy way. So then basically this attention will be applied to all different heads independently in a very um, convenient manner. That's the really the, the key here. And then after you applied your attention, that's exactly this part, right? You have applied this and you just basically concat that and do linear transformation. So you apply, um, you, but, but in order to do that, you have to first, um, where is it? You have to first transpose this again because we want to concat, uh, we have to come back to our um, head being at after the sequence lengths, right? So basically, that's why we do the transposition again, one and two. So now again, the, the H becomes here and then sequence length goes here. And then we uh, reshape this with batch size. And we again, um, combine this into H times DK, which is basically the same as concatenation function, right? You basically concatenate that into one. And then after that, what is it? Um, we just uh, uh, just apply linear function, which is this W W O. So that was a the most complex part of the, I would say, transformer is done. So other things are quite relatively simple. Okay, then probably this is much simpler, right? You have a fit forward network, which is just applying two layers of fit forward with ReLU in the middle. So you have a W1, W2, which is linear, linear transformation. And actually note that the DFF is the um, output value of W1. And it doesn't have to be exactly the same as D model, but I'm pretty sure they use the um, uh, actually larger number. Yeah, so they use 512. So they start from 512 and then they expand to 2048 and they come back to 512 again. That's why you have two linear functions um, which come from D model to DFF and then going from DFF to D model again and drop out again and just apply that. And um, we have embeddings, which is just, um, you know, vocab and D model again, 512, right? In this case, and then just um, you just have, uh, you apply your embedding to your input IDs and then you um, actually do some scaling by multiplying that by with D model square root. And there is a position encoding. So this might seem a bit complicated, but you can think of it as just you're um, enumerating your, um, this, you're basically just computing these values depending on what the I is. D model is fixed, right? This is 512. You're just computing what the I is coming from starting from like one to, for instance, 512, then you just have uh, some fixed values for each different positions, right? And then you just basically um, compute that with this, like uh, all these different these math equations, but th they're pretty straightforward though. You basically just compute these. And then at the end, what the position encoding does is that they return, uh, given the some word embeddings, they basically add the word embedding with this um, position encoding which is not trainable. So that's the important thing. It's actually requires grad is false, which means it doesn't train, it's fixed number. So actually to be more exact, probably I think a crack practice with the modern, more recent PyTorch is that used constant value instead of this variable. But anyways, um, these are really old version of PyTorch and then apply dropout. Remember that we're applying dropout here too, right? So you now have a position encoding. If you actually, um, do some, I would say, visualization, then you will see that you have a different sinusoidal graph with different period 
with different dimensions. So basically here, you will see that you have a higher frequency with lower dimension and you have a um, longer, high, a lower frequency or longer period with the um, higher dimension. So if the dimension is like something like 5, 512, 5, 512 dimension will be something like very long, right? Very high wavelength. And after this, we basically just, uh, you know, connect everything, right? Um, so we create the uh, multi-attention with this ATTN, and then um, we have a feed-forward neural networks and uh, position encoding, and you create a model, which is encoder-decoder model, and encoder will be encoder with encoder layer, and there is some attention functions here, um, decoder with decoder layer and attention functions coming up. And then um, sequential is just a PyTorch um, model that makes you just uh, connect one, one after another in a convenient way. So you just connect embedding, the output embeddings go into this, um, the, what is it, um, this C. And you have a generator. Remember that this is basically just um, output of the decoder. So decoder just have a decoder output embeddings, and that output embedding is, is translated into word embedding, a word um, probability distribution to get the output. And um, it's just basically some training details that they have uh, some um, initialization with Xavier, which is uh, a, have been, I think, experimentally more more better than the like entirely random initialization with um, some standard deviation, Gaussian. So, and actually it says, the paper says that this was really important that actually do this initialization. So you, instead of random initialization, you did Xavier, which depends on the, 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 uh, the size of the parameters, the, your scales and everything. Um, we just do small example model and it looks like it's working, right? We have a, in this case, the 10 will be the source vocab um, and the 10 will be target vocab size and the two is uh, layers. And training, um, so there's a bit of a complication here. It's a lot of um, how you train things. Um, probably I'll not be going to too much details today on the training side. Um, there are more of, a, I would say, um, details than, um, I mean, these are really important things, of course, because how you train is, uh, you know, really important. But um, basically, you see that how they create batch, they have to do like padding things. Like padding is really um, stressful because you have you have to deal with different like, sequence, sequence length. And I think probably you already experienced this in your assignment one. Uh, what, what if you want to take, um, you want to, put different sequence lengths together, then you have to actually pad. Um, although I actually in, in, um, intended that uh, you figure that out or hopefully of course you have heard of it to make it work, but because padding is not like the only way to do it. It's basically one way to do it. If you have best size one, then you might not want to pad at all, right? Um, and if you're not using GPU, then padding is also might not be necessary as well. But if you want to parallelize thing, padding is quite necessary. And basically they try to pad things here with creating a batch. And there are a lot of useful functions PyTorch has come up with native libraries that helps us to do this batching. And they're running Epoch and your input is model here. And now you have a data to iterate through and you have a, your loss compute function. And what they do is just basically you enumerate data into batches and then you put the batch source and batch target into your model and your output will be used for computing loss against the batches target Y. And then you basically just, um, total loss is just, um, you're basically just, um, what is it? You, come, you add this loss to your total loss, we start with zero. Um, and then, um, what is it? After you compute loss, Let me see. That's weird. Mm, I think if I remember correctly, then maybe this loss compute actually also does the training step. 
or maybe the train step comes after that. Um, let me see. This is the optimizer and Yeah, so they, they put the loss uh the step in the the loss compute function class function class object. So it, I'm not I'm not I, I don't entirely agree. Uh I mean probably people have different ways of you know putting things. So in this case, uh what uh the author did, what uh Sasha did was um basically where is it? Um here we go. This loss compute um, not only compute the loss but also updates the uh, actually pro pro uh, progress the loss by one. So they basically update gradient do this stochastic gradient update basically stochastic gradient descent update one step up of uh, update and then return the output loss value and they're just keeping different values so that they can actually have uh, some st statistics at the end and there are some like. Um, different ways of batching you can take a look into that and you use some optimizer they use atom optimizer with um, some specified um, these parameters and of course people can use different parameters to maybe train better but they have this different learning learning rate schedule too they have like uh, going up learning rate really fast and they basically come down slowly this is also quite um um, popular schedule that's being used a lot. So basically, you learn really slowly at the end, at the start, and then you basically kind of really, you know, increase your learning rate a lot, and then kind of slow down again. Mm. And then there's some regular regularization. I uh, told you about label smoothing. Label smoothing is um, basically you're computing um, cross entropy, but you might wonder why. So I, I think this is like additional material you can read. Um, probably not super necessary at the at the moment, but you might wonder why are they using KL divergence? And it turns out that actually KL, KL divergence and cross entropy, um, they they actually uh, the objective wise they are equivalent. Um, it's just that the value is uh, their their values are a bit different because um, the um, there is a term that's not included in the. Um, um, I think I forgot which slide, but basically you can think of it as they're quite equivalent and um, cross entropy and KL divergence is um, with, uh, with the, some fixed term. Other than that, um, they're basically equivalent. So they're using this to compute the, the trying to basically make two probably distribution quite similar. That's, you can think of that as um, that's the objective. Um, so label smoothing and basically they now do this some example right so they do uh, some they create some synthetic data and then they compute loss and loss here is uh, it's a really simple um, probably cross entropy or kill divergence loss and they actually when you're calling them they actually compute the gradient which is this backward and then they do one step which is basically updating the um, parameters and then the uh, zero the gradients, which is something you have to do all the time after you step it. And of course, um, they just return some loss to for the statistics at the end. And greedy decoding is um, you output one word at a time. Um, they talk about, I think, some other decoding at the end, but that's um, more advanced things like, yeah. Um, I think beam search is this, BP is by pair encoding. So they have a better, um, word tokenization and some weight averaging. These are more of tricks, but I think I discussed all the essential things um, up to uh, what we have covered in the lectures. So hopefully those were helpful for you to understand what the transformer does. Um, so in the next lecture, we'll be going into more about a bit of uh, other details, other modern, I would say tricks, including like BPE. And um, these are really important. And also I'll be covering a few other topics soon in the, um, I would say, um, problem formulation wise, and I would say um, task wise, but we'll be soon done with um, basically all different kinds of problems, tasks, and models. Um, that's, I would say, uh, kind of first part of the, um, the class. And the second part of the class will be basically not about 
modeling or um, I would say task, but more about it will be about how the learning paradigm has changed from more of a vanilla, um, I would say very um, MLE, maximum likelihood estimation driven learning to more of a pre-trained language models and um, more recently in context learning. So you can think of it as basically uh, first part of the class is nearing an end. And the first three assignments will be actually, I mean, all the assignments will be actually, and I mean, first three assignments will be about this first part of the class. So actually I'm up a bit over time today, but hopefully it's all good. So yeah, good luck with your assignment for the rest of the, like say uh, seven hours. Um, see you next Monday.